Hello, entrepreneurs. Joe Duchara, CPA, coming to you live from downtown Flushing, New York, for another amazing interview. And today I have, we have Lynn Power. How are you, Lynn? I'm great. How are you? I'm just trying I'm to good. stay out of the rain, and you probably are too. Oh, where where are you? I'm in the Berkshires. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm in Flushing, and uh, it's we got uh, one of those storm alerts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it might go <laughs> off again, just in case. Uh, yeah, so, no worries. So we just met. I know very little about you. That's how I like to do my interviews, so we can get to know each other. And so tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I'll just jump in. So I spent my, well, I shouldn't say my whole career because now I have a second career, but 30 years, it's a long time. I think that's, that, that constitutes a career uh, in advertising. Um, I, I worked at most of the major ad agencies that if anyone has watched Mad Men, you will recognize uh -huh. the names, BBDO, Gray, Ogilvy and Mather. Uh, I was the CEO of J. Walter Thompson, New York. Wow. And then I decided, you know what? I'd been doing this for other people for so long and I'm not getting any younger and I need to start doing it for myself. So I left in 2018 and I, I launched my own business, my own brand. And I actually now have a clean hair care company. I have two companies, a clean hair care company and a luxury bee powered fragrance company. That sounds interesting. <laughs> You're the second person I spoke to this afternoon that has two companies. So I don't know why I make myself crazy, but I just, ha you know, yeah. when you run across a good idea, you just have to make it. And then you deal with the consequences, I well, guess. <laughs> it's part of being an entrepreneur, I guess. So <laughs> tell me, you know, I have no idea what those businesses are. What, what do you do? Okay, so um, they're both businesses that are in the sort of luxury self-care space, I guess you could say. So the premium hair care businesses, you know, shampoo, conditioner, well, maybe <laughs> you're not in the market for it. <laughs> no, not anymore. Not anymore. Shampoo, conditioner, shine serum, and a styling cream. And we launched it New York Fashion Week in um, February of last year. And the other business is called, uh, and that's called Masami, by the way. Um, and the other business is called um, Il de Nature, and, which means Nature Island. And it's um, our hero product is a beeswax candle, a scented beeswax candle. And the whole idea was to create products that are better for you, you know, good for you, good for the environment, that aren't toxic, that aren't going to be, you know, you're not going to be scrubbing chemicals and detergents into your head, and you're not going to be breathing soot from toxic candles in the air. So, that's kind of why we set out to do it because I find that a lot of the large companies still are making products that have crap in them. So who do you manufacture the, these products? I mean, I don't personally like make, <laughs> but yes, um, we have, we have a chemist actually in Chicago who does our hair care and they specialize in clean formulas by clean, meaning, you know, no sulfates, no parabens, no phthalates, um, and they're like small batch natural, like we were really lucky to find them. Um, and then for our candle, we have a, we actually get our wax from Dominica. It's a really long story. <laughs> <But> okay. <laughs> we have hives in Dominica. We get our wax from Dominica and cool. we, um, we, we actually manufacture in the U S both products though. I think that's important too. Nice. You know, we want to try to keep business local and support businesses here, you know? So tell me a little bit about your advertising career, because I, I think that's uh, fascinating. I, I have a friend that uh, he actually created this, this whole program <clears throat> based on the advertising model. And he talks about, what's his name? Ogilvy. Mm -hmm. and, and the yeah, big idea. Okay. You, you ever hear of the big idea? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ogilvy okay. on Advertising was one of the, you know, top books that you had to read when you're a young account executive starting out in the business. Now, I don't think kids read anything. <laughs> <laughs> they just do it, which is perfectly fine. But yeah, um, I started off out, boy, it was the late 80s, long time ago. And so uh, 
do you, do you want me to just talk a little bit yeah. about her? Yeah, go on. go on. Oh, okay. So yeah, so I started in the late 80s. I, I really fell into it. I went to school for criminal justice and English. Those majors don't even go together. So don't even ask me what I was thinking. But I was kind of in my head thinking I was going to go in the FBI. I, I wanted to sort of be a, you know, Clarice Starling kind of thing. Well, that didn't work out clearly. Uh, Clarice. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but I ended up, I ended up, uh, basically I was in Chicago, I was living at home and it's, this was 1989 and it was not easy to get a job back then. There was a bit of a recession going on and the FBI was actually having a hiring freeze. So I met a headhunter because back in the day, there's no internet. You don't, <laughs> you can't. Yeah, I, re I remember. I'm, I'm cutting out the newspaper cutting out ads, circling ads. I find some recruiters in Chicago that have a bunch of jobs. And I go and I meet with this woman, Beverly Von Winkler. And she says, you're going to go to this ad agency and interview. And I'm like, okay. She liked me because I could type really fast. I can still type really fast. It's a really good skill to have, by the way. So I go and I interview and they hire me to be a receptionist on the spot because I was like a breathing, speaking human. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, I took the job and, um, and I, I loved it. I ended up, you know, going from receptionist to account coordinator to account executive. It was on the pizza hut account at the time. And, um, that was just a really great introduction into advertising. And I felt like I liked the idea of blending creativity to solve business problems. Cause you know, a lot of corporate jobs don't, don't allow you to kind of do that. And advertising is just such an interesting left brain, right brain combination that I just really enjoyed it. And I also like the fact that you get to work on loads of different things. I mean, one day I'm working on, you know, Gillette skincare for men. And the next day I'm working on pizza hut and Campari <laughs> and Tylenol. And you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's interesting. You never get bored. So now you must use all of those skills in your in your current business. You know, I have to say, I do feel prepared on some level. I was not prepared for COVID, of course, but no one was. <laughs> and launching right before COVID was certainly interesting. Yeah. But um, but you're right. Like having that background of being able to kind of look at businesses and understand the go to market strategies and understand the marketing tactics, the consumer, the target, the positioning. It's super helpful because I can shortcut a lot of that stuff. And actually, I was doing a little consulting with startups, and I found that a lot of startups don't, they don't understand brand. You know what I mean? They have a product that they love and they think it's amazing, but then the brand is nowhere in terms of messaging and people don't even know what it stands for. You know what I mean? Because that's just not, they don't know. They don't have that muscle. They don't, they've never used it. So having that ability to kind of like tell a brand story and like when we launched, you know, one of the things for both of our businesses was making sure that we had our values really pulled through the entire business. You know, a lot of companies will do like, you know, some type of charitable association or foundation or something as like a bolt on because they feel like they have to. And in our case, it was like, no, that's, that's part of what we believe as a company that we are going to build hives and therefore we're going to build <laughs> hives. You know what I mean? Um, and then from Asami, it was like, well, we're taking our main ingredient from Japan, from the ocean. So it's our responsibility to give back. So we set up the Masami Institute to help fund ocean research there because they still are suffering from the tsunami that hit them in 2011. It's still not back to normal. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. So tell me a little bit about team building because that, that was on the graphic that I guess my, my team put together. Well, that I think is absolutely one of the most important things you can do in business, whether you're in a corporate job or you're an entrepreneur. Probably I would even argue more important if you're an entrepreneur because you can't afford to have the weak links on your team. Because if you're like me, you, there's there's like three of us you know, we, and we do a lot. And, you know, so um, so I what I've learned about team building over the years is, um, well, first of all, um, people are not always good at the things that they think they are, you know, <laughs> sometimes people have these aspirations to be, you know, I want to be writing the copy for this, or I want to be doing the social media for that, or I want to be, and they're actually better at something else 
production, account management, strategy, you know. So sometimes I think if you want to really focus on getting your team to be a high performing team that coalesces well, one of the first things you have to do is understand everyone's superpowers and understand what they're bad at. <laughs> I, I don't mean to sound it so harsh, but you no. know what I'm saying. Yeah, like, I'm I'm bad at most things. I'm really uh, good at like three or four things. I highly doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, like for me, I don't love QuickBooks. It's like my arch nemesis. I hate it. And if I have to spend any time in QuickBooks, I have the worst day ever. And everyone in like my friends and family know to avoid me all day because I'm just a grouch. So that is like my weakness. And I know it. So I've just decided why am I torturing myself? I don't need to be putting myself into something where I'm not good at it and I'm just going to be miserable. I'm going to bring somebody else who is good at it in to do it. And that's a big part of team building. It's recognizing people's capabilities and their skills and what gets them excited and motivates them, not just what they're good at. Right. And then being able to pull those capabilities together so that everyone is really performing at their peak in terms of what they love and what they're good at. And then also, of course, giving them feedback and guidance along the way. And I think that's super critical because a lot of times, and advertising was really bad about this, actually, those agencies we talked about, they don't really give people feedback. They just kind of like throw you aside or, <laughs> so, you know, I always felt like you owe it to your team to be honest with them. And it doesn't mean you have to be mean but people want feedback and they generally take it really well. And if you're constructive and you're doing it from a good place and it comes from the heart and you're trying to help them grow and learn, I think I've found that nine times out of 10 people really appreciate it. And so I think that's a big part of the team building too, is being willing to just have those tough conversations and sit down with people and say, hey, you know, that wasn't a great meeting. Let's talk about why, what could we do differently? you know, not torture people at all, but, but it's important for people to learn and grow. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, uh, that's been part of a big part of the struggle building the team, trying to figure out everybody's different skill sets. We, we had some exercises to like identify what we're all doing. And then we juggled a lot of, a lot of stuff around. So you juggled it on purpose to mix yeah, it up? Yeah, because like we had somebody doing uh, web pages and we had a graphic designer that turned out to be able to do the web pages a lot cleaner. Yeah. You know, so then we we just switched jobs around. You know, we, we changed, what do they call it? Change seats. <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes that's a great solution and you have all the right people, you just don't have them in the right roles, right? And it sounds like in your case, that's a great situation to be in because you're not having to fire somebody and bring somebody new and you can just kind of shuffle the deck chairs and, and you know, yeah. re rearrange and reorient. I mean, I think the key is also making sure that people um, are clear around their roles, that they understand their responsibilities and that they understand what they're being like graded on. And I don't, you know, I don't mean it like, you know, it's so formal all the time, but people want to know that they're, that they have the ability to, to, to move up and to go somewhere in their career. So if you don't kind of lay it out for them and say, look, this is where you are now, this is where you could be. And they go, that's awesome. I want to be there. Or they go, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> and you're like, okay, well, that's a good conversation to have then. Cause obviously. Right. You were on a path to go there and now you're telling me you want to go there. Um, but I think that transparency and just the alignment and, and, you know, I'm kind of anal about it, like putting together job descriptions just because I find it does really help people wrap their head around what the expectations are and what, what, you know, what you're really wanting them to do. And sometimes you end up negotiating around those job descriptions like, well, I wasn't really thinking I was going to be doing the social media content. And you're like, well, and then that's OK, because because, again, it's all about getting people on the same page and getting people in a place where they feel supported and motivated. And and also that there's like when I say support, like that nobody's that people have their back. You know what I mean? Like that no right. one is going to be like sniping for them when they screw up. Um you know, and unfortunately in advertising, there was a fair 
amount of that, you know, it's like, oh, I want that person's job. And, you know, but I, I think um, the industry has gotten a little bit gentler, for, fortunately. Um, but, but one thing that's happened, which is sort of sad, is there's no training. So when I started in the business in the David Ogilvy days, <laughs> there was training. There was the David Ogilvy like program that you went through and you learned how the right way to do brand building and all that stuff. And now it's like these kids are just thrown in and there's, there's really wow. no training whatsoever. So you're really learning on the job and that can be scary um, for everyone really. But um, yeah. you know, I do, I do wish that agencies, probably not just agencies, corporations are probably in the same boat, right? Like that, you know, they need money, they cut the training. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, but hopefully, hopefully, you know, that can't sustain itself. Right. Cause yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I get, I get what you're saying. So Lynn, listen, I, I try to keep these uh, short because people don't watch long videos. <laughs> sure. So, uh, any parting words of wisdom? My parting words of wisdom, I would say if anyone's thinking about doing what I did, which is making a career pivot, um, two things. One is build a network of people that you that you can rely on, that you trust, that are advisors, peers, mentors, reverse mentors, whatever. And then secondly, build your team, just like we were talking about. That is so critical. It, you'll, you, doing it alone sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's impossible now. It's impossible. You need to have support and, and you need to have support that you trust. So yeah, spend a little time on those things. And I think you'll be set up for success for whatever you want to do. Awesome. Uh, how do people get in touch with you? I'm easy to find. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on all social media at Lynn Powered, or you can find me through Masami, lovemasami.com. Lovemasami.com. Yeah. I'm going to check that out. Check it All right, out. Lynn Power. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You too.